Yaakov sends messengers to Esav. And he sends gifts. He's trying to appease his brother. Enough with the fighting. First he ran away. He didn't have anything. Now he has a lot to lose. His wives, he has children. He has sheep. And he feels really threatened. He feels like he has no security. These people had very real emotions. They were very alive. They weren't in the type of spiritual mindset where what happens in this world doesn't matter. They were in the extreme opposite type of mindset. What happened in this world is the only thing that matters. Not because of this world not because this world is so precious in its current form. This world is a mess. They didn't enjoy this world particularly. They did what they could, but life is very difficult to them. Humanity was very powerful. The people were very developed. The good were very good. The evil were very evil. And life was a constant struggle of good against evil. Those who were good had it more difficult than those who were evil. They had to play by invisible rules and principles that the others didn't have to play with. So it's like going into a fight with your hands tied behind your back. Because you're answering to someone that is looking for perfection. They're not answering to anyone. They're doing what's easiest at that specific moment. They don't understand the consequences. They don't realize what they're entangling themselves with. And so because Yaakov knows what he represents, because Yaakov knows that he is the future, so he cares. It's a big deal for him. He's tuned into a much bigger picture. He's tuned into a picture where the creator of the universe is trying to make order. And it's on his shoulders. In a way, we might say it seems like the relationships the relationship that each of the patriarchs had with the Creator was almost the opposite of what we're used to today. Today, when we mention the Creator, we say, oh, you don't need to worry. It's not really up to you. It was meant to happen. Everything goes the way that it should. And Yaakov doesn't see the world that way. None of the others do. Moshe Rabbeinu even doesn't. Moshe Rabbeinu argues with, with Hashem. You know, it's, it's, it's in the Pasuk. It's very, it's very clear to read. They didn't think like us. Not even one bit. They felt that they are very involved in what's going to take place. In fact, they felt that it's completely their responsibility what's going to take place. That if, for whatever reason, they miscalculate, then they're going to regret it when they leave and they realize that they could have done it better. But then there are limits. There are limits to how far we're allowed to go because the one that we're going to answer to, he created the principles. 
And so the principles are still his. Even if we have a very deep desire for a certain reality, we still can't violate his principles, not within the desire and not within our way of getting it. And so, the others are trying to navigate life and they're constantly unsure. They're constantly wondering about what's going to happen next. This is even after they've had direct contact with a power beyond that clarifies to them that they have been chosen, that they are the purpose of humanity, that they are the realization of man. And yet, they're very insecure. Yaakov was scared. Yaakov was scared both ways. He might get killed or he has to kill his brother. Neither one of these options were attractive. And so then he meets Esav and he bows down to him seven times. And here there's, there's different ways of interpretation. Some say it was wise what he did because he calmed Esav down until the opportunity passed where Yaakov was vulnerable and then he'll manage already. The Zohar says, terrible, terrible decision. Bowing down to Esav is the last thing Yaakov should have been doing. In fact, by bowing down to Esav, he showed weakness. He made Esav stronger. So here again we see this. Yaakov is sort of guessing how to behave, no clarity. He has to go and he has to do based on circumstances. That's all he has to go by. Very different than we imagine. Yaakov Avinu, who doesn't know Yaakov Avinu? Of course, if you're Yaakov Avinu, you're walking a confident step. No, no. If you're Yaakov Avinu, you're even more unsure than the rest of us because you know a little bit what we're dealing with over here. Confidence comes from not seeing the picture fully. Confidence in spiritual matters comes from immaturity. Certainty in our beliefs comes usually if we've only believed one belief. We've never realized how wrong we can be. Once we realize how wrong we can be, how can we have full confidence? How do we know we're not missing something? So this struggle between Yaakov and Esav is this struggle between the truth and what seems to be the truth, but it's not, otherwise known as superstition. Yaakov and Esav is the truth versus superstition. We would think that the truth is the confident one, and superstition is the unconfident one. No, the exact opposite would be the truth. Superstition is extremely confident. Truth is not confident at all. If we can ever come by it, it comes by in a whisper of a maybe. Because our minds are so steeped in superstition. It's all we've ever really known. This is the nature of exile.
this confidence that superstition has is the reason it can be so violent, the reason it can be so fanatical, the reason, the reason it can lose all reason, it can deform a human being. Because there isn't enough of an appreciation of what's being sacrificed with this belief, what's being sacrificed, what could have been if not for this belief. How would life feel if we believe different? And so therefore, the superstitious are the ones that are so confident that they're doing things right. The ones who are doing things right are the ones who are constantly afraid that maybe they're not doing things right. And so from the outside it would seem the other way around. People would follow the confident one. He knows he's doing right. If I want to feel safe that I'm doing right, I better follow him. And yet his confidence is what proves that he hasn't understood the subject. He doesn't appreciate the sensitivity. He doesn't appreciate the vast potential of possibilities. It's a human nervous system. It's trillions upon trillions upon trillions of potentials. Are we certain we know the best potential that's available at the present moment? Could anybody ever be? Could anybody ever know the best potential that's available at the present moment? The only time these people had confidence was within the context of prophecy. When the greater consciousness was speaking directly through them, they were very confident. They couldn't be more confident. Any other time, and they were filled with doubt, they were filled with various emotions that today we would assume that somebody who has that level of clarity would never have to deal with. They dealt, we might say, with more emotion than any of the rest of the population. If we look at David HaMelech when he is describing his situations with Racha Kodesh, we see expressions of emotions that we don't see anywhere in life. No one today has the capacity to experience those emotions and remain coherent in order to express those emotions. These people lived raw. They lived life directly facing reality. No assumptions between them and reality. They knew that everything is possible and yet that doesn't take away from the kindness of the Creator because this is so much bigger, so much more complex, so much deeper than we can appreciate that we shouldn't assume that it's going to align with our perception, with our understanding, with our assumptions. There's enough evidence of the capacity, the power, the intelligence, the kindness, everything we can realize within creation. But the master plan is not available. It's not available to us. It was not available to any human being before us either. Not to the highest prophet and not to the wisest. The master plan belongs to the one who designed it. And so in order to remove this rawness, in order to make life more easy on the nerves, we used different metaphors and different distractions and different rituals 
in order to lessen the meaning of life, in order to create a world of symbols that sort of correlates to reality. So our imagination could have a relationship with reality while it's not living, while it's not fully exposed to the full force of reality. But this symbolic reality, this virtual reality, has traveled very far from where it originated. It traveled to a place where the symbols no longer reflect any sort of reality. The symbols have a life of their own. The symbols have been used and abused by people who desired power and by people who lived in fear. And they caused the meaning of these symbols to deteriorate over thousands of years of people no longer knowing what assumptions were these symbolic metaphors based on. What was the purpose? What were we trying to convey? What reality are they talking about? So Yaakov represents the true knowledge of the symbols and Esav represents using the symbols as a means of power. Using the symbols as a means of power is the origin of superstition. The interest that one has in peddling superstition is power. Whether they're doing it in their own home or they're doing it to a community. If they're preaching superstition, it's not because they're getting life out of doing it. Superstition doesn't give life. Superstition creates fear because it doesn't align with the soul. And so those who are peddling it is because they want to create fear. You only want to create fear if you want control. And so Esav represents using the sacred symbols, using the sacred, using the power and the force of life in order to gain power, in order to force other people to do what you want. They come to places where people have been worshipping in ways that are a lot more meaningful and a lot more real than anything that they can represent. And by the force of violence, they make them use their symbols, they make them convert, and by doing that they remove the sacredness of life. They try to force the sacredness of their symbols as if symbols can be more sacred than life, the life that the symbols represent. To them symbols are more sacred than life itself. They've forgotten what the symbols are for in the first place, who the symbols were meant to serve. Yaakov remembers. And yet, in order to fool Esav, he can't show that he remembers. So from the outside, Yaakov and Esav have both forgotten. And yet from the inside, Yaakov remembers. Esav doesn't want to remember. And so the truth that the others represent cannot be represented in symbols. We're not allowed to represent it in symbols. Lo isas l'chopesa v'chol t'muna. You're not allowed to create any statue or any image or any symbol for the sacred. The sacred is sacred. The sacred is the source of life. Anything manifest, and there's already a danger of idol worship. 
even symbols. Today we might say symbols more than anything else. In the beginning when they were worshipping the sun and the moon, they, they were doing something that had some spiritual sense, it had some spiritual logic behind it. So then everybody understood that symbols only represent the forces. We're not worshipping the symbols themselves. Today, people don't know what worship means anymore. Today, the symbols are in charge. Nobody understands that there is an actual sacred reality that needs to be worshipped. And this is because of the levels, the layers of Gullus that came one on top of the other. This could never have happened in one fell swoop. This had to happen over many generations. Generations that kept on removing the wisdom from us, forcing us to forget, forcing us to change, forcing us to assimilate, so that we no longer remember what we really represent. So we can also no longer hold on to the sacred that has no symbol. The sacred can only be held on to when the mind and the heart are pure. As soon as the mind and the heart become contaminated, they can no longer contain this sacred connection to the place that can have no symbols, to the source of life that is everywhere and is nowhere. It is everywhere, but nowhere can it be found or seen. And so all the exiles were a process of completely defiling the sacred. Why? Why do these people have the power to defile our sacred? Because we defiled it first. Because we forgot. Because we made things more important than life itself. Everything we made more important than life itself represents another nation that we were giving power to. Every nation represents something, a part of life, that they've made more important than life itself. And we represent the sacred that cannot be any part. It's only all parts. Because it represents the one that is no part and all parts, everywhere and nowhere. This connection to the infinite, to the undefined, is represented by the Beis Amigdash. When this connection is alive, the spirit inside man is alive, not only for us, even the other nations. Chazal said, if the other nations knew what it would feel like for them when we have a Beis Amigdash, they would all rush to Jerusalem and build it for us, just to enhance their own experience. But experience cannot be documented. Even symbols are a poor representation of experience. And so they didn't know, and we don't know. The wise have left some documentation of how much the world lost when the relationship between creator and creation changed. When the sacred that is beyond symbol was defiled by things that were made to be more important than life itself. People that were made to be more important than life itself. People that caused others to bow to them, to bend their will, to bend the will of the masses to the will of one. The will, the divine power that's running our awareness. A 
פסק סס, צפס אמס תיקן לא עד, ועד ארגיע לשן שוקה. A language of truth will remain for eternity, while a lie, a language that's built on lies, can only last until the situation calms down. Meaning, the world's in a frenzy. People have lost their minds. Therefore, superstition seems real. Nobody has an attention span that's long enough to even realize what's being said. But once things calm down, somehow, for whatever reason, all these languages are going to become meaningless. They're going to be void of any meaning, because even now they're void of any meaning. We're just not sharp enough to realize. We're saying a lot of things, but we're not really saying anything. We're running around, people are talking all day, there's papers and there's laws and there's... So much has been written, and yet the words cannot contain what we're talking about. We're talking about something much more important than words. The words are almost meaningless compared to what's really taking place. So only a language that can give us access to a more meaningful interpretation is a language that relates to the truth. And that language will remain for eternity because it's the base of language. It's what's happening inside of us that results in language. It's the movement of the being that speaks. Every interpretation is giving us access to a worldview, to an experience, to a perspective. These perspectives, their life, their color of life, their flavor of life. Their potential that's been dormant within our nervous system ever since humans was created. Ever since speech became available, all combinations of letters and words are available. They all have different results on our nervous system. It's knowing which ones to choose that makes us learn how to really speak, how to really start touching the nefesh amadaberes, the soul that is the purpose of our entire organism. So this struggle has been the cause the struggle between Yaakov and Esav, the struggle between the truth and what seems to be the truth, the struggle between the confident and those who care, the struggle between those who are looking for the truth and those who are looking for power. has been going for thousands of years. This struggle already started from the first two humans that were born from Adam and Chava, where one killed the other. The one who had the truth made an offering, the offering was received, the one who wanted power made an offering, the offering was denied, so the one who wanted power killed the one who had the truth. Rather than going to learn how to do it right, rather than fixing whatever disconnect he has with his source, he finds someone to blame 
and he gets himself into much bigger trouble. And so that, that energy, that instinct, that evil spirit that was created so early within our species has been haunting us ever since. The evil of the one who killed and the helplessness of the one who was killed. Both of these spirits have been haunting humanity ever since. And they came forth as these twins. The helpless one seeking the truth, who now has to learn how to defend himself, how to stand up for himself. He's always afraid because he knows what happened before. It didn't work out so well. He knows what his brother is capable of. He knows it instinctually. He knows it on the spirit level. It's not a knowledge that he can overcome simply through thought. He knows it from experience. And so he's naturally afraid. And yet, he has to stand up for himself. He has to learn how to be confident enough and not bow down in front of his brother. Not bow down in front of something that he knows is not accurate simply because he's afraid. And this, this lesson continues with us until this day. Yaakov is still afraid of Esav. Yaakov is still bowing down to Esav. The truth is still very difficult to find while the lies are everywhere. And so this is upon us now. Now is our time to decide who of the twins should win. Which side do we take? What do we believe? Because only when within the present moment there will be people who are ready to stand up for the truth, will something change? Until then, Esau will continue. The lies will continue. And the wise teach us that every day that Esau is in charge, the world is deteriorating. The world means our experience. Our experience means also our biology, our physical stamina, the function of our organs, the desire we have to be here. All this has been deteriorating day after day for thousands of years. So we can't even imagine what it was like to be here a few hundred years ago, and certainly not a few thousand years ago. And we can see how today the smallest things, the smallest traumas, and people lose their appetite for life. People had huge traumas in the past and they did not lose their appetite for life one bit. If anything, their appetite for life increased. Their organs worked, they could have a nice full meal after coming home from war, and they would digest their food just fine. Today, people are very, very sensitive, very fickle. They've lost the taste for life because life has been deteriorating, because we've lost touch with the sacredness of life. We've lost touch with the sacredness of the undefinable. We've been living on symbols, symbols 
that have lost their meaning as well until they're completely disconnected from the truth that they're even trying to represent in the first place. And so we, just from the little bit that we have where we can taste life, we can realize that life is something very worthwhile. If after 2,000 years of deterioration it looks like this, it means that it's very precious and very powerful. It's very worth having. And it's our struggle that's going to decide if we're going to have it in this incarnation or we're going to have to wait for future generations. There is a destiny. It's not a question of who's going to win. Everybody knows who's going to win. But just because we know who's going to win doesn't mean that what we do is not going to cause who's going to win. We know who's going to win. We don't know how they're going to win. We don't know who's going to cause them to win. We don't know what it's going to look like when they win. And so reality is being shaped. Reality is becoming. Reality is real. There's, no, there's nowhere where we can gain a guarantee that we're doing the right thing if we're not constantly concerned and trying to do the right thing. There's no mindset that's going to allow us access to reality unless we care enough about reality to be there. And the more intense the war is, the more it's our responsibility to pay attention. And the war between good and evil has only been getting more intense. There's more suffering now in the world than there was only a few short years ago. And that means that we have to give it all we have. We have to gather our energy. It's meaningful. This is everything. We will get paid for our effort. We're not working in vain. There is a bigger purpose. And yet, being in the embodied, being on this planet means that we can't have access to the bigger picture. We have to work from within. We have to work based on what's available to us. We have to interact with the unknown. That's the way it will be constantly interacting with the unknown. Even when we go higher and higher, more realizations, more truth, and yet we're still interacting with the vast unknown. And that's the truth. That's the place where the people who were looking for truth lived. So we should all be zoiched that we should be able to find that truth. We should be able to live that truth. That truth should live us and should redeem us and unite us as one. Questions? It seems like the only way we know the truth is if we know we're not comfortable and unconfident. It's not the lack of comfort that makes you aligned with the truth. And even though these are two symptoms, it doesn't mean that if you have the symptoms, you also have the disease. So <laughs> you can be unconfident <laughs> and very distant and uncomfortable and very distant from the truth. But it's not uncomfortable. I would say they found a certain comfort level while interacting with the unknown because if they didn't, then they wouldn't be able to pull off what they pulled off. So they, were, they had certainty with their principles and they, and they remained connected. So they felt a certain, you know, they, they felt a certain pride in what they were doing. They knew their importance. They weren't humble in the sense that they thought that they're worthless or that they're meaningless or that they're unimportant. But they were humble in the sense of realizing that whatever we can know is only a very, very tiny piece of what we can't know. And what we know is also in a relationship with what we can't know constantly. So what we know is only as true as how much it aligns with what we don't know. But we know that we don't know so much more than what we know. Exactly. So, so based on that, we have to interact. So these people interacted with life based on that. Those who came with the confidence and said, I know how it needs to be, 
right away we would know that he can't have truth unless he's a prophet. The truth is not, is, doesn't come in that format. Even prophecy doesn't come in that part, format because you still have to be on a certain level to know which, which uh, channel you're tuning into. But that, the nature of prophecy is knowing the channels, is, is getting to know the equipment and knowing what you're receiving. Otherwise, we wouldn't call him a prophet. So even the Via Shekhar were called Nabiyim, but they were Nabiyah Shekhar, so yeah, they knew they, they knew, were turning into the wrong channels? Of course. Yeah? Of course, that was a choice. Of course. Yeah, yeah. No, if a, if a, if a prophet thinks he's a prophet and then and then he finds out after he dies that he was really a false prophet, then that would sort of ruin the entire Torah, because <laughs> you know that would take away all choice. Prophecy means you know the truth. That's the nature of prophecy. So he does know the truth. He can't be called a real prophet, but. People who had false prophecy meant that they were channeling other spirits. But then why would they do such crazy things as you being, saying things to do that meant Be that they weren't going to happen? Because they already gave up on the truth. But and why would they give up on the truth if they saw the truth and they knew the truth? They didn't know the truth. They knew how to channel... No, they knew how to channel... They knew how to channel spirits, but they weren't prophets of Hashem. Hashem wouldn't speak to them, so they didn't know the truth. But they could channel, and it could seem as if that they, they were channeling just like the Holy Spirit. It's, when the Holy Spirit is speaking, it's also a form of channel, even though it's the, it's the resident spirit. But it seems like someone is talking through this body. And the same would be for someone who's channeling the spirit. But those spirits were not representing the truth, and those who were channeling them knew this. They knew that they weren't real. And they did it because they had a desire to maintain whatever was working for them, to maintain power, to maintain possessions. And they, they knew that as soon as they leave this world, they, they're already gone anyway. They don't stand a chance. They're going to be recycled. So they took advantage of whatever they could while they were here, just like the Erev the Zara. So they, they sort of, they didn't think that they could make it through, through getting to the truth. They realized that they had certain flaws that they didn't, they weren't ready to break or overcome. And so then they basically s they sold their soul to, to the other side, to, to doing whatever is convenient, even if it doesn't align, and even if in the long term it's going to cause them a lot of suffering. And eventually what happened to them is they, they kept on coming back to the wash machine until they're amongst us. They're, they're, we're all here for, for some serious crimes against humanity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to go through what we're going through. So, humanity has been, uh, you know, our history is not so pleasant. And we're going to have to own up to it. Just like an individual has to own up to their history before they can fully heal, the collective is going to ha have to own up to their history before they can fully heal. There, there are going to be reparations. You know, people are going to service humanity now in order to make up for the suffering they've inflicted on humanity in the past. And from all this selfless service that's in the, with, done with the right intention, the world is going to be rebuilt. May it happen soon.